The news of a fourth Matrix film being in the works got me in the mood to revisit the series, so let's red pill up and see how deep this rabbit hole goes. It's The Matrix versus Reloaded versus Revolutions on Movie Feuds. Believe it or not, Keanu Reeves wasn't the first choice to play the leading role in The Matrix. Not even entirely sure he was the 30th choice. Everyone from Will Smith to Nicolas Cage turned down the role, and I'm very grateful for the decisions. Keanu Reeves oozes cool as the hacker turned chosen one, Neo. Trinity, played by Carrie Ann Moss, is just as awesome. Especially when she levitates up into the air in a karate kid pose to knock a foe through a wall. My favorite of the trio is Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne. My boy Fish is equally a mentor and a true believer, constantly putting himself in harm's way to protect Neo and fight for the cause. And plus, he just looks badass in any setting he's in. Whether he's wielding a katana or just chilling in a leather chair, it's always working for him. Outside of these leads, there's a bevy of supporting characters throughout this franchise. Gloria Foster as the Oracle is phenomenal, and it's such a shame she passed away between the filming of Reloaded and Revolutions. Mary Alice takes over the role in the final film. It's one of the rare instances where a character change in a film franchise can easily be explained away since they are just software inside of a program. That doesn't mean it doesn't sting a little bit. As good as Mary Alice did, it, it, I still miss that original Oracle. And to press a bit further into this, it's unclear as to why the software continues to take the shell of an elderly black woman and not, say, a young, spry, athletic type. But maybe it's crunched the numbers and that's the most comforting appearance one can take. I don't know. Most of the crew in the first is killed off, but they still manage to leave a mark. Switch, Apoc, Mouse, Dozer, and of course, that Weasel Cypher. The sequels bring in a bunch of new members, most of which are likable enough, but at the end of the day, they just kind of pull away from the main interesting storylines. Niobe was a fine addition, as she added a bit more dimension to Morpheus' character, and the Merovingian was an interesting side villain, even as cumbersome and often annoying as his monologues can get. Plus, he was usually accompanied by Persephone and her lovely assets. Speaking of the twins, the ghosts were a really fun concept introduced in Reloaded. We're told that vampires, boogeymen, and other scary elements are all faulty or obsolete software that refused termination. Reload also gave us Colonel Sanders, aka a.k.a. The Architect, who led to many a meme and a great Will Ferrell impersonation. I really dug this character and would love to see him return in the next film, vis-a-vis -vis The Matrix 4. Don't think I've forgotten about the highlight throughout this entire saga, Agent Smith. Mr. Anderson! Every time he says that, I just, I get goosebumps. Smith and the whole agent concept is so freaking great. There's a level of tension whenever these guys hit the scene. And the whole concept of Agent Smith coming back in the sequels as a virus is genius writing and one of the greatest storylines cooked up by the Wachowskis. I'd love to talk more about that. Ergo, let's head to the story round. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. Thankfully, we get six plus hours of just that. The Matrix was never intended to be a trilogy, but when Warner Brothers unloaded a giant dump truck full of golden bricks in front of the Wachowskis, I mean, sequels had to be made. The first film does feel separated from the second two precisely for that reason. While I do enjoy all three movies for different reasons, some the same, I have to say the first is just incredibly special to me. For starters, it was insanely revolutionary. There have only been a small handful of times where I've gone to the theaters and felt like I was witnessing history unfolding in front of me. It's a monumental experience to be had. Like, after it was done, I couldn't wait to talk about it with everyone I knew and even strangers on the streets that would yell at me to leave them alone, but I couldn't because I had to tell them about the Matrix. The moment Trinity takes out a couple of officers and runs from agents, I knew this movie was going to be something truly unique. The world we know, the world we inhabit right now, is bullshit. It's a lie. It's a computer simulation and our real bodies are encased in some fluid-filled sacks. 
rocks housed inside giant machines. We emit energy, which is exactly what these suckers need to survive. Congratulations, humans. You played yourselves when you scorched the sky, causing the machines to take new measures to survive. Now we're grown in fields, harvested like human happy meals, all while obliviously thinking nothing's changed all these centuries later. There's a small subset of humans within the Matrix that aren't fooled by this fake world and they're fighting back however they can. Neo's one of those people, but he's not just woke. He's an entirely different beast. He can do things no one else can do and is the reason why Morpheus fights so hard to get him out of the Matrix. And the first film really is all about this. Freeing Neo's mind, training him about the ways he can break the Matrix and free all those inside. There's certainly a lot to unpack there and more than enough for two more outings. The Wachowskis had other intentions though, some of which I think work spectacularly and others not so much. I assumed Reloaded and Revolutions would put a large emphasis on freeing minds and waking people up. Turns out, that's not even remotely the focus. The big plot revolves around the underground sanctuary known as Zion. Specifically, saving Zion. This place is mentioned a couple times in the first flick, but we never see what Morpheus is talking about until Reloaded hits. Essentially, it's pretty terrible. A bunch of catacombs and gears fused together. The humans spend most of their time down there dressing poorly, talking about work, and occasionally having a fun dance orgy. The Zion stuff is just not very interesting to me, frankly, but over time, I've grown to accept the direction this franchise went in. Reloaded, thankfully, still has plenty of great tricks up its sleeve, and there's plenty of time spent inside the Matrix. Neo's endgame here is to speak with the Architect, but in order to meet the Architect, he has to find the right door and unlock it. In order to unlock the door, he needs the Key Maker. In order to get to the Key Maker, he needs to get through the Merovingian. The Merovingian is a smug program whose only goal is ultimate power and status. Outside of that, though, there's a larger threat looming in the background, and that is Agent Smith. Back from the dead is a full-blown virus, the yin to Neo's yang. He's the answer to the question. Or perhaps the question to the answer, I don't know. Somehow a part of Neo was coded onto Smith and now this agent is no longer tethered. He's free to go where he pleases and he's got a fun new superpower at his command. The ability to make copies of himself by infecting everyone else. These storylines all build upon each other until the final moments where it's revealed and reloaded that Smith has infiltrated the real world and Neo is able to manipulate the Sentinels. Which not only ended on an insane cliffhanger for a movie, but also provided another layer of complexity to everything. So many questions and fan theories were going around. How was Agent Smith able to take over the body of a real human being? How can Neo destroy sentinels in the real world? Is the real world even the real world? Maybe it's a matrix within a matrix. This was pre-inception, mind you, so just a ton of new ideas coming forth. The final film kind of answers these things in the vaguest of possible ways, which honestly I don't mind. The whole franchise is built upon the questions and not so much the answers. The answers are oftentimes boring and inconsequential to the narrative. Revolutions to me is the weakest of the three and it's because I once more just don't care in the slightest about the Zion storyline. Unfortunately, a large chunk of time is dedicated to just that. This also feels like the most Hollywood of the entries. The first film was so different than anything else. A popcorn film for a unique audience. Revolutions is often your standard action vehicle, complete with large mechs shooting hundreds of thousands of rounds of attacking robots. That aspect doesn't do it for me, but there's still plenty to like here. Morpheus, Trinity, and Seraph, for instance, going on a rescue mission to save Neo, now stuck in limbo. This leads to a top 10 Matrix moment for me, where the three of them go through these subway turnstiles, all in different fashion. Completely nonsensical how they do it. Trinity does like a ridiculous cartwheel. It's everything I love about the Matrix condensed into a three second shot. The Lobby Shootout 2.0 was a bit fan servicey, but there is such a lack of time spent inside the system this time that I welcomed every moment of it. The real reason to finish this journey is for the final act. Smith versus Neo is the definition of epic. Ultimately, it goes a bit Hollywood, but it does not end in a way I think anybody imagined it. The Matrix reset sets for the seventh time, I believe, and basically all humans are still batteries. Zion is spared, 
I guess that's great, even though it's just a crappy rock cave. And there is a truce in play. Not exactly the victory many probably saw coming when Neo flew away at the end of the first film. Now, there are tons of spiritual references and symbolism in the franchise too, but I'm not even going to go down that road. I, there's been many other YouTube channels that have dissected the Matrix and all the spiritual stuff and whatever. I, I don't care about that. Neo holding out his arms and turning to pure light should be obvious enough. Let's get to another big highlight of the movies, which is the production. The Matrix came out in 1999, 20 plus years ago. Yeah, let that shit sink in. I saw this thing in theaters three times, which tells me two things. One, the Matrix still holds up incredibly well, and two, I'm old as dirt. Sure, there are a few spots where age is clearly showing. Same can also be said about the Matrix. I never really noticed just how green the color gets when inside this world. They went all in on the color green. It's less pronounced in the follow-ups. The cinematography is really something special too. The lighting is very well done, with many atmospheric shots just screaming to be put into a digital collage and hosted on a GeoCities website. I made a dumb, dumb amount of collages for this movie. At what end, you know? What, what was the point of it all? The big deal was, and still is, the bullet time effect. Achieved by stringing hundreds of cameras in a circle around the actor and using frame blending to create pure, uncut eye candy. It's a shame this technique was stripped back in the sequels. In fact, I don't think it was really used at all in the third. They do like a CG version of it in Revolutions, and it's only done one time. I'm super disappointed. There's plenty of slow motion. Don't get me wrong, but slow motion and bullet time are not the same. They're, they're just not. Thankfully, the over-the-top sound effects continue throughout the trilogy. The simplest of movements can trigger a dumb amount of swoosh sounds, and I'm always all in for it. The music is such a joy to listen to, and one of the areas where the sequels really take things up a notch. The Burly Brawl theme is a personal favorite of mine. Don Davis and the Hollywood Studio Symphony managed to make a high-speed chase from ghosts and agents while zipping between cars on a motorcycle alongside a sword-wielding ally. Cool. I don't know how they did it. Almost an impossible feat. The courtyard fight in Reloaded against all the Agent Smiths, that's like top five action scenes for me of all time, and I've seen every Jackie Chan film known to man. Okay, maybe not every, but I've seen a lot of them. Yes, it bounces between real actors and very good video game graphics, but I don't care. We're in a fake world anyways. They can get away with it. I do think the first had better visuals, even though the budget was laughably small in comparison and the tech was less advanced. It just seems like extra care and craft was put into each and every frame. Morpheus vs. Smith is a great example of that. They look like they're dueling in a David Fincher film, complete with old toiletries and a dilapidated foundation. Revolution has a very impressive sentinel war, although some of the green screen is very obvious with coloring mismatches. We do get that rain fight though, and it heals most of those wounds. I, I truly believe it heals most of those wounds. It's time to end this. Believe it or not, I didn't do this movie feuds because I thought people would be on pins and needles trying to figure out which one would be declared the winner. I think it was fairly obvious to everybody involved. I just wanted to review movies in a way that I thought was fun and engaging and maybe even trick people into not knowing I was reviewing movies at all. We do have results to get to and in last place is Revolutions with a punishingly low 3% of the votes. In second is Reloaded with a barely better 6%, making the original the easy winner at 91%. One of the largest victories on the channel, easily in the top 10. This is the order I would put the franchise in as well, and even though Revolutions was a pretty big disappointment for me, I still watch and can enjoy some of the concepts at play. Reloaded is just pure enjoyment, while the first is special for all the reasons great movies are. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you want. And remember, this is more than just reviews, this is movie feuds. Matrix is set as of now to come out in 2022. And quite frankly, we can just go ahead and skip right to that point. I'm, I'm ready to go now. Ready, ready to be there. Thanks for watching the video. I try to put out new stuff on a weekly basis, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. I have a second channel full of more shenanigans, and I'm also on Twitch now. So there's a lot of variety, a lot of options, and hopefully you can find these channels via links on this video itself if I did my job correctly. Otherwise, they might be in the description below, or you can just visit the channel page. All right, take care.